<laughs> cool, cool. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is our second talk, so I guess you know us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about understanding Tor Onion services. So, just off the bat, Tor Onion services used to be called Eden services. Uh, we changed the name. Uh, for obvious reasons, especially media, likes it uh, when it's hidden services, uh, put bad things in there. Uh, so first of all, uh, this talk uh, is going to be a much more technical than yesterday. Uh, we're going to go deep into hidden services, uh, attacks, next generation, so on and so forth, but also use cases. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with uh, how Tor works, because we didn't do that yesterday, and this is an important part, so we all understand what are uh, different parts of the network. So. This slide, you probably, uh, you probably saw the, 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 the diagram many times, EFF has one. So basically, Alice wants to talk to Bob, uh, goes through the network. And then encrypted links are the blue ones. And the first one is the guard. So it's very important that you understand what a guard is, because we're going to talk about guards quite a bit. Uh, guard is the entry node. Uh, so you get a guard after a while when you relay really stable enough and it's fast enough. And then you get this flag so people can start using you. Uh, every client, every hidden services, uh, every uh, component in the network interacts with Tor circuits. You use a guard and will pin the guard for around three months. And our reasons behind that, we won't go into details, you can ask us. But keep in mind, this guard, you have it for a long time. Then you go to a middle, middle is any, pretty much any relay, and then exits. So the exits, uh, in this case, uh, uh, this is just the Tor circuits. In the case of Onion services, we, you don't have exit because you don't exit the network. Uh, but uh, exit are specific, very special uh, nodes in the, in the network because traffic gets unencrypted there and sent into the open interweb, unsecure in, uh, internet. So this is what we call a Tor circuits, three ops, basically. So a uh, quick overview of uh, what is, uh, hidden services are, onion services now. So basically, one uh, .onion address, 16 character longs. It's base 32. It's pretty easy to understand there. Uh, it's a client services side, both are hidden. So both have anonymous, uh, are anonymous. So it's a very important property because uh, as a client and as a server, you can protect yourself. Uh, everything stays in toward, inside the Tor network. That means that uh, the onion service traffic doesn't go, outside, uh, doesn't go through an exit node as on the internet. And all sorts of TCP traffic. Remember, Tor is, all, is only TCP. Um, so quick history here, uh, hidden services are quite old, 2004. This is the first commit uh, about hidden services. Uh, 2004 is, what, 12 years ago, so uh, pretty old. So we're going to show you how uh, this has been evolving. Uh, first of all, so in 2014, maybe to beginning of 2015, we started to uh, have statistics to, me to try to measure what's going on in the hidden service world. Uh, this was a quite a bit of a challenge. It took us many months, actually, to come up with a uh, privacy uh, uh, way, a way to collect those statistics in a privacy-oriented uh, way. So this is the amount of unique .onion addresses that are currently in the network. We don't know what happened in March. Someone, you know, just created half a million of those, and, uh, <laughs> and then it, it, it went back. So right now we're around 60,000 unique .onion addresses. So that means... Uh, 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 unique ways, we don't know, I mean, we don't know if it's clients, servers, or whatever, but right now this is the state. And this is the traffic. So those are the two statistics we have, the number of onions and the traffic. Um, so yeah, this, uh, I don't know, we, we absolutely don't know what happened again. Uh, it dropped, maybe like someone leaked a huge thing and it stopped, uh, we don't know. Uh, but overall, uh, what it gave us is a way to show that hidden, tr uh, hidden, tr hidden services, sorry, onion services, are still very, very low amount of traffic of the overall Tor network. So it's uh, every client that connects to an onion services, it's around 4% of the overall uh, traffic in the Tor network. So when you're in the media or whatever, uh, governments or propaganda that uh, toys, only bad things in the dark web. Well, remember that it's only 4% of this overall traffic. And in this 4%, it's also a small percentage. So now we're going to go into properties and use cases. It's pretty nice. All right. So um, hidden services or onion services have a lot of uh, interesting uh, properties. First of all, they are self-authenticated. 
uh, they are end-to-end -end encrypted, self-authenticated in a way that, like, uh, if two uh, a server and a client are talking to each other, they don't know where, like, the server doesn't know where the client is, and the client doesn't know where the server is. They just know each other, and uh, they can authenticate uh, with each other uh, with with different layers of encryption. And uh, but they they know like who that person is, but they don't know where that is and what's the IP address. Um, they are end-to-end -end encrypted. There is uh, no need for uh, CA Mafia, basically, uh, to get a certificate for whatever. And um, you can pretty much do a lot of isolation um, when you run an Onion service in a way that you can basically run um, a server somewhere. It could be on a Raspberry Pi in your apartment, and uh, it doesn't even have to ha be uh, exposed to the internet, like, Globally, like it doesn't have to have an static IP address. You can you can do a lot of NAT punching because Onion addresses don't really need a, an, a public IP address. Um, you can minimize the surface attack uh, just by doing that and and other stuff. Um, you can do uh, a stealth mode that I'm going to talk about a little bit, and you can um, like in a stealth mode, basically uh, even if you have the the even um, like somehow people find the address of the onion address, they cannot like connect to it directly without the key, the the, uh, the actual key that they need. And um, you can use Unix sockets to basically get rid of uh, TCP in your uh, setup. And uh, they are censorship resistant. Uh, nobody can censor an onion address. And there is also like when you use onion addresses, there is no DNS uh, or BGP hijacking, poisoning bullshit. Um, so here's the stealth mode. Um, you basically need to um, add TorRC file and add this option that uh, it's hidden service authorized client. Um, and in, in this mode, um, what happens is that each client that wants to connect to your hidden service or onion service has a unique onion address with a unique key. So they should have like uh, this, um, the, the first part is the onion address and the middle part is the um, unique key and then uh, the, the last part is the, the client, and you can see the like, user one, two, three have different onion addresses and different keys. Uh, this helps because uh, you know, like if, if you uh, want to have an especial infrastructure set up, um, which I'm going to talk about uh, later a little bit. So uh, what are the use cases of onion addresses? Uh, what, like, is it like everybody thinks of onion addresses just for, I don't know, like um, a, a crazy website um, to deal drugs and whatever. But that's not the, whole, the only thing. Because of all the good properties, um, health sector could, uh, could take advantage of these things. Um, they, um, government services for, uh, you know, like a lot of the things that um, governments do, uh, they don't necessarily need to collect all that information about people to, you know, like uh, we've heard um, about OPM hack and, and all of the different things. Um, tip lines, abuse complaints, whistleblowing platforms, uh, you all know about Secure Drop and Global Leaks. Uh, there, is a, there, there is a magazine that is only available over Onion. It's called Tourist. Um, yeah, and there are um, uh, some person, like some artists also dropped an, uh, their whole album on, uh, on Onion addresses. So if you wanted to uh, download the album, you had to like go to the Onion address. You can uh, secure your vulnerable infrastructure. You can take advantage of this in libraries for like library catalogs and, and everything. This is like specific, uh, especially interested, uh, interesting for me because I work with Library Freedom Project. Um, you can, uh, Nathan of Guardian Project did a thing on Internet of Things, Home Assistant. Like basically if you, are, if you, are, if you want to run one of these things in your um, apartment, you, you don't need to expose the whole thing to the internet. If you want to connect it from your mobile phone to that service, it doesn't have to be open to the internet. Uh, you can just connect over Onion address, and it's pretty, pretty much safer uh, than internet. Um, so if, like, uh, a lot of people, like, uh, you know, have this question, like, what about malicious exit nodes? What if, like, I don't know, some, um, some government agency or some bad actors are, uh, you know, like running a bunch of exit nodes and taking over um, all the running exit nodes. So basically, whenever you use onion addresses, as David mentioned, you never use the exit nodes. You never exit the, the traffic. You, um, the, you never exit the, the Tor network. So uh, the exit, none of the nodes actually know what, what's, what's happening. There is like a Tor, tor 
um, daemon on the server that uh, like all the applications are connecting to that uh, daemon server, um, that, that Tor daemon on the server over Unix socket, and uh, there is a Tor daemon on the client side that all the, um, Everything is it is either going through Tor browser or if you're um, you know like if you're doing a crazy creative setup, it's also using socket. So you're like only just Tor Tor. Um, you can use it for file sharing, right? Onion share. There is messaging applications like Ricochet that basically needs no um, server in middle. Like there is no um, there is like there's just there are just two clients talking to each other. And that's it. Like there is nothing else. There, there is no need for OTR or anything because it's already encrypted. And uh, the, you know, like when two people are talking to each other, it's it's fascinating because even if like um, the original developer of Ricochet like disappears tomorrow, or I don't know if like he abandoned the project or whatever happens, you can still take advantage of it, and it it works forever. And um, the other thing is that like it, it basically eliminates the, the issue of metadata all in one. Uh, there is no username, there is no password, there is no metadata at all. Like nobody, like if somebody uh, looks at your traffic, they can't even tell that you are chatting. Like they can, they can, they can't tell what you are exactly doing. Um, you could run on cloud um, instances for I don't know, like a lot of different things. And um, you, I, I have a lot of repositories that uh, are in my apartment, and I only connect to them over um, Onion. And uh, the interesting use case could be like all of the mobile apps could, um, like if you're um, an Android developer or iOS developer, you can basically put uh, this service in if you want to like fetch config files or whatever. Especially if you're in, uh, if your users are in censored areas. We will talk about that later because fa Facebook did something awesome uh, with, with this regard. So I want to talk about like an special use case that is actually uh, this is based on true story. It's it's already happening in the wild. So imagine that you are having um, a web. You are running a website, and that that website you are like doing things uh, correctly, and um, that HTTP uh, that that PHP website is like uh, the app server is on a different VM. There is, uh, there is a, I don't know, like Nginx reverse proxy on the web server that is serving a, um, a static HTML, and you have a, you know, DB uh, MySQL like, like imagine that this is the WordPress uh, website with a bunch of vulnerable plugins and whatnot, and then um, you have users, contributors uh, to that website that need to basically connect to the app server. Now, if you um, like, when you have this setup, even like, even though it's like, um, you know, distributed and like everything is compartmentalized, and uh, there is a still the risk of exposure. There's the risk of exposure of your uh, PHP uh, server, application server, and there is the risk of exposure of your DB server. But if you do it over Onion, uh, what happens here is that only the user like. Each, each of these onions are unique onion addresses. So what happens here is that the database doesn't, none of these, nor, not the database nor the application server have a public IP address. What happens is that they only talk to each other, the application server and DB over onion, and especially if you do uh, the stealth mode, as I explained um, in previous slides, you, you need to have like a very unique, um, Onion address and the key to be able to connect to each other. So even if somebody finds the Onion address uh, of your database, they are not going to be able to connect to it. Um, so it's going to be like much. It it makes it much much harder. The other thing is that if you have multiple users, uh, multiple contributors, each contributor gets a unique um, Onion address. So if, for example, one of them gets compromised for whatever reason. You don't need to change anything. You all you have to do is to like basically, if I um, go back to this thing, you just comment out uh, that user uh, uh, thing, uh, like uh, that 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 user, or like delete it from your TorRC file, and they that basically that onion doesn't work anymore, and you you leave the rest of the infrastructure in place. Nothing um, compromises. Um, all right. Okay, so uh, now it's going to get extremely technical, so uh, be careful. 
All right, uh, onion services work. So we're gonna make uh, an overview of how onion services, onion services, cheese, onion services works. Uh, the step one. So there's there's multiple things here. Uh, in this slide, you'll see Alice, which is a client that will try to go to the service, and we have in this case uh, the big Tor network, which is a big cloud, uh, obviously, and then uh, the introduction points. So this this first thing is introduction points. The service will pick at random. Three introduction points. Introduction points are relays in the network. We have 7,000 of them in the network, so just pick three of them. Uh, and uh, we'll create what we call a descriptor. So this descriptor uh, is basically a text file that explains how to get to the service. Uh, some fancy crypto and uh, uh, ad addresses of where to go and so on and so forth. The service will upload this descriptor to a directory. We call those HS directory. Uh, HS for hidden service. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot change that to onion service for now, so keep in mind, HS directory, it is an onion service directory. Uh, and then, what's gonna happen is that Alice will fetch the descriptor from the directory, and with this information, with the descriptor, knows how to reach out of service. In the same time, uh, Alice will create a circuit to a rendezvous point, so the RP in this slide. Uh, this RP is, again, a random relay that Alice will pick. So what's going, what's going to happen is Alice will go to an introduction point, and it, uh, Alice knows where it is because it's in the descriptor, uh, and tell the service, please meet me at this rendezvous point. Uh, and then the service connects to the rendezvous point and, uh, at this, and kills the circuit with the introduction point, and then we have a six-op circuit between Alice and the service. And it's very important because three ups one side, three ups on the other side, well, we have an anonymity both sides. Um, so this, those are the basics of what our hidden services works. Uh, please try to remember the introduction point, the uh, rendezvous point in directory because uh, we're gonna talk quite a bit about them. Directory here. So this is all, there's this, uh, this problem here that uh, how, which directory Alice needs to connect to to get the descriptor since there's Actually, directory here, there's only one, but in reality, there are six. Uh, the, so the descriptor is uploaded to six different directories. Now in this case here, it's easy. Just create a hash, take the onion address, some time period, which is basically the time right now until uh, UTC, blah, blah, blah. You can read the spec. And then the descriptive cookie, in this case, it's empty. So the descriptive cookie is used for authentication. So when you add a client, you have this extra key. Well, this is how this, this, this with only this extra key, you know which is the descriptor ID. And then a replica. Replica is basically which H is there. Uh, and then you have a descriptor ID, so it's a long string. So this descriptor ID, when we base 64, 16 this one, and it gives us a bunch of numbers. And at that point, uh, this is while the service and the client, remember, because this computation here, uh, it is deterministic. So that means Alice and the service will compute the same thing. Now, with 3378, each relay network has a fingerprint. And then we're gonna upload this descriptor to the closest relays f matching the fingerprint. In this case, 3378, 7B, and 7D. So we have picker three relays in the network. You are in our HSDRs. So this HSDR gets the descriptor, stores it for 24 hours. Well, 18 to 24 hours, something like that. So it looks like this, a, a Nash ring. H the descriptor ID starts, and then you upload to three HSDR, replica zero, replica one. So we have symmetry in there, and we, we go over the network spread out over the network. Uh, so uh, now you know how hidden service works, you know what the directory is, and all this, it's uh, basically a design that is, was made in 2004, implemented, fixed over the years, but then cracks started to form. Uh, this is why we are going into this next generation in services that we will talk at length after, uh, just after we're gonna talk about the cracks. Uh, so in first thing is that currently right now in, uh, oh yeah. So in Tor, we, in the last two years, it was a huge effort to get rid of all cryptography. Well, we, let's call it weak cryptography. Um, and hidden services right now is the only remaining, remaining piece in Tor that uses RSC-124. Uh, not SHA-1, SHA-1 does other things, but RSC-124. So yeah, in this case, uh, is this scene uh, getting plausible with hidden services? We don't know. Uh, but uh, it's a problem. Now, another thing. 
directory gets the descriptor. Remember the descriptor is a text file that informs you all where to go. In the descriptor, you know, this is a, a snippet of a descriptor. You have this RC public key, which we call the permanent key. Basically, your onion address. So it's very easy for any directory, any relay that has the HS their flag, gets descriptors, get, and it's in clear text, and then just compute the onion address. So what we call enumerating onion addresses. Uh, this attack has been going on, uh, unfortunately, in the Tor network, and we are actively trying to detect that, actually, because it's a very harmful thing. Because people are just running relays, harvesting onion addresses, and not only that, but they're creating business model around that to crawl the dark web, dark web. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really bad, it's, uh, and we know about that. There's, there's literally hundreds of companies doing that. Uh, so this other thing, uh, you can pull off a bunch of attacks, unfortunately, with uh, uh, being an HSD uh, and also a guard, we're gonna talk about that at length, uh, and when we call it a HSD camping attack. So a relay can change his fingerprint very easily. And since this descriptor ID, and, uh, the computation is deterministic. You know that in two years, where it's going to be, because the time period goes in. So you just compute this old ash with the onion address. It's an invariant. The scripted cookie, the replica, this old numbers that are, and then the only thing that changes is time period. So this time period in two years, you just add two years, and you know exactly where it's going to be. So we have relays do, to attack the, the network do that. They change their fingerprint to have this exact place where they need, they need to be, this, like the HSD2 here. Uh, and then they get the onion address. So let's say you want to monitor uh, WikiLeaks uh, uploads. Well, you just take up WikiLeaks onion address and you compute your fingerprint to be specifically the, the, the right one for the HSD, and then you can just know who is, how many people are fetching uh, WikiLeaks addresses. Here in the ash ring, basically, you camp and you know it is. So one of these attacks, I'm going to go a bit faster, is, here, is uh, the HSD dynamization thing. It's a timing thing. So hidden services are at specific patterns of, of uh, circuit creation. Remember, I'm going to upload to directory, and then, uh, 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 oh, in this case, it's client, sorry. The client is very specific. It's the same for hidden service. Uh, I'm going to fetch the descriptor from directory, open an RP circuit, connect, uh, connect the IP. So in this case, uh, I put timings, if you can see. But the, the point is just to... If you're a malicious guard and also a malicious HSD, this is how the attacks goes in. You want to correlate who is getting which admin address on the directory, and as a guard, you know which client on which circuit is connecting, to, uh, is getting this onion address. So use timings here. First, first, uh, first circuit, you get the directory. Two seconds later, one second later, you have the circuit is killed. So it's very specific, a distinct pattern here. What's going to happen is that Alice creates an, an RP connection and an RP connection. And then at the same seconds, so it's noticeable again. And then the circuit is killed at the IP once you introduce yourself, and then it goes to the RP. And once the RP is done, well, traffic goes through the circuit. So you see this very, very distinct pattern. Uh, a, 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 three different circuits, timings, and then, oh, you know which onion addresses. In this case, it's a bit difficult to pull off because you have guard and directory, you need to be the, the, the malicious attacker that needs to control both. Uh, and remember, your guard also rotates every three months, and one of the reasons is uh, we don't want your client or hidden service to uh, rotate guards quickly so that the attacker can make you pick his guard. Now, this is a much more fun attack. Okay, so here is another interesting attack. Um, imagine that uh, there is an attacker, that uh, pumpkin thing on the top right, which uh, wants to learn the guard node of an onion service. Guard node is the first hop of, a, of every circuit from an onion service. So it's basically the only relay on the whole network that knows the IP address of the onion service. So it's a, it's, a, it's a significant relay for that onion service, basically. Now, imagine that the pumpkin has also set up a few middle relays around the network, malicious, bad relays. And here is the attack that it can pull off, basically. It knows the onion address of the, uh, of the, of the onion service, so like, for example, the WikiLeaks onion service. And uh, since it knows the address, it can uh, pretend to be many, many clients. It can pretend to be 9,000 clients and try to establish 9,000 circuits to the onion service. And, um, and uh, well, let's move to the next slide, actually. It's uh, more graphical. So imagine that the, the pumpkin on the right asks the onion service on the left to establish 9,000 circuits because it, it pretends to be 9,000 individual clients. 
The Onion service has to has to do this because it doesn't know that the attacker is actually one bad guy. So it starts creating circuits. And every time it creates a circuit, it uses the same guard node, but it changes the middle node. The middle node is, is, a, is, a, is a different random relay every time. And uh, since the attacker has middle nodes on the network, eventually, like, if it asks for enough circuits, eventually the Onion service will pick one of the attacker-controlled middle nodes. So, for example, the, the second circuit on that diagram has M2, which is red, and it's attacker-controlled. At that point, if the attacker can realize that indeed the attacker controlled M2 is on the circuit, which is something that they can know because the attacker, for example, has a circuit to the hidden service and can send a signal. It can send like traffic, no traffic, traffic, no traffic, and this can be monitored by M2 and figure out that it's indeed in that position. Then M2 can just look, look on the previous hop and be like, Ah, that's the guard of the of the onion service, and 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 hence it can discover the guard basically, and um, since it knows the guard of the hidden service, it uh, it's uh, it's it's useful knowledge in general. You can you can then move to other attacks since uh, that node is the only node that knows the IP address of the of the onion service. Um, so that's the attack. We're going to talk about defenses after. All right, so those attacks you saw with the HSD, uh, uh, harvesting onion addresses, uh, this guard thing are actually uh, huge problems. Uh, so the next generation onion services tries to address some of those. Uh, and let me tell you, it's, n it's not an easy thing. Um, first of all, of course, yeah, better cryptography. Uh, you get a curve, everyone gets a curve, uh, and we use uh, SHA-3 also. So yeah, uh, great, amazing, better, better cryptography. Now. Uh, this is a problem. Uh, as I told you, business models are getting uh, created about, uh, on this and making money, blah, blah, blah. So we have this problem where time period is predictable and so on. We have the same descriptor ID uh, uh, equation there with a nice timeline showing you where it, it, different descriptor ID sh uh, changes. Uh, at 11, changes to a new one, and so on and so forth, so you can predict it. So one of the solutions that happened uh, at Tor is that we, we decided to create uh, to have, add a random value to this. But it's kind of difficult to add a random value that Alice doesn't know, only the service knows. So if only the service knows, well, Alice can't find it. Uh, so the shared randomness is basically, you have there the eight directory authorities uh, in the network. Uh, so a quick thing, if you don't know what directory authorities is, it's basically eight trusted machines around the world with trusted operators, we hope. And uh, every relay uploads information to the directory authorities. Directory authority gets this information, which is a server descriptor, again, a text file, and create a consensus. So they all vote, and they see the same thing, and they create a consensus. This consensus is a view of the network, all the relays, how to connect to them, and so on and so forth. But also, we added this thing where they're going to, every 24 hour, they agree on a shared random value. So they all create commits, and then they're going to reveal, they, so there's a commit and reveal phase, if you're familiar with this. And then they reveal, and then they mash up all the commits, and it creates a random value. And because of this consensus, uh, okay, let's call it technology, uh, uh, happens, all directory authorities create the same consensus, thus the same random value, and then publishes it. So it's a bit like the NIST, the NIST uh, random beacon, I think, but uh, in this case, it's trusted. Uh, <laughs> so, so we have this random value, and then it's great, because now uh, the descriptor ID changes every 24 hour, and thus the camping attack doesn't work, <coughs> because it takes you five days to become an HSDR. So if it changes 20, every 24 hour and you rotate your key like a crazy, uh, well, you can camp. Now the second thing, uh, well, it's, it's one of the main, main uh, changes here. Uh, the other thing, I don't think we have a slide about it, but the descriptor uh, ID, uh, in the next generation in services, the onion addresses in the, the descriptor, we use this crazy trick uh, key blinding thing. Uh, makes it that hidden services cannot read the onion address. They cannot learn the onion address, but if they have the WikiLeaks onion address, they get the descriptor, they can ash it and get the descriptor ID. So they can know that this descriptor is WikiLeaks, but they cannot learn onion addresses. That's a new improvement also in the next generation. So this 
took us a long time to get uh, to get work. Uh, weirdly, engineering it was very really complicated, but now we have more year one. It's running it, and in the next uh, version, 029, which is stable around October of Tor, all those directory trees should run it, and then Tor will create a shared random value uh, every 24 hours, which is great because then other applications can use it, other projects, and so on and so forth. We believe it's uh, fairly trusted. Um, I'll go pass this to uh, to George now. Okay, so currently the onion addresses, this thing on the top, the 16 characters, is basically 80 bits of, of a hash of the public key, base 32 or, or something. And uh, this is basically 80 bits of security, which is not enough in this case because uh, someone can brute force these 80 bits and get an equivalent address and then they can basically impersonate a hidden service. So moving to bigger addresses is uh, something we definitely need to do. And uh, because of the whole uh, key blinding thing that David just described, where we basically um, defend against the attack where the HSDR just uh, sits on the hash ring and harvests onion addresses, when we fixed this attack, we basically had to move from, from the address being the hash of a public key to the address being a public key itself, specifically an ED25519 public key. And uh, these things are not so small. They are actually quite big. And uh, if, you, if you turn them into characters, you get to see 52 characters. It's the thing on the bottom. It's quite big. We're not even joking about this. Um, and <laughs> and um, it's, uh, we will, we will um, I mean, the usability kind of breaks down because it's not like you can memorize 16 characters, but 52 characters starts to become uh, quite, uh, quite lengthy. And, uh, and uh, we, will, uh, we will need to address this uh, UX disaster in some way, uh, <laughs> potentially by, by building like some sort of a pet name address book system in TBB, or, or we, we have some ways where we can bring 52 char characters down to like 48, 46, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there is, a, there is no clear path how to bring it down to something uh, human readable like 16 or something we don't know we this is uh, still one of the things we we should uh, that that the, the ux things that we need to figure out for the next version um okay so this might have been interesting um okay so the attack i described before where basically the attacker sets up uh, middle middle relays around the network and then forces the onion service to create over 9,000 circuits, and it eventually uh, hits the, the malicious middle nodes um, uh, so that to, to, to get the guard of the hidden service. Um, we have, we have uh, a possible design to fix this. Um, it's this. It uh, also <laughs> seems quite complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. But anyway, the, the idea here, the very rough idea, is that instead of, uh, instead of for every circuit, the hidden service picks a different middle node, um, we, we have guard sets. So basically, instead of only pinning down the first node, the guard node, we also kind of pin down the second node and the third node. So, um, so in this case, we keep the guard node, the first hop, for three months, the second layer guard node for a little bit less, like a few days, and the third layer guard node for a few hours. So if the attacker tr tries to, to do the same attack again, where it, uh, it sets up middle relays on the network, um, the onion service will not, every time it makes a circuit, will not pick uh, a new random relay. It will, it will only ro rotate second layer guards every 11 days. So only every 11 days the attacker has a, has a chance to, to become uh, the middle relay of the, of, the, of the onion service, basically. So this uh, slows down the attack quite a bit. And uh, we're still uh, like tweaking the parameters and working on the proposal. It's called Proposal 247. You can uh, Google it, and maybe you can uh, find more information about it. Um, OK, on, on the happier side, uh, another, another um, like future improvement on hidden services is uh, on scalability, because we have many people that want to run onion services in a more robust uh, like enterprise manner and currently this is not possible because uh, there is only one hidden service that accepts uh, clients and uh, usually in like in like uh, serious uh, business environments you have round robin and uh, load balancing and all that shit so we have this uh, we have this software called onion balance that we have not 
We have not actually promoted it at all for some reason, but you, should, you guys should know it. Um, <laughs> it's basically a way to, to set up like, um, like uh, multiple identical hidden services, say eight or something, and then you, you basically take all these hidden services and you build a super descriptor that contains all that information and you use that as your address. So clients, when they take that super descriptor and they, and they, and they connect to one intro point out of that descriptor, it can go to any of those eight individual onion services. So basically you get load balancing on the introduction point layer. Um, it's, uh, it's actually quite, uh, quite easy to use. Um, you, you just have to, to set up N hidden services with the same web root or whatever and then point onion balance to them and then onion balance will do all the rest. Um, you can get the GitHub uh, link there and try it out, please. I think we will be quite interested in uh, your experience. Um, okay, so this is another, uh, this time performance uh, improvement. Uh, mainly designed for onion services that are not meant to be anonymous. Yes, there are this kind of onion services. For example, blockchain.info has an onion service that is not anonymous and they don't care for it to be anonymous, but they still want an onion service so that uh, they get the protections of, uh, of Tor and also that their Tor clients do not go over exit nodes and the uh, exit nodes uh, change Bitcoin addresses and all that shit. So basically blockchain has an onion service that uh, they don't care to be anonymous. And for them, the, the, the onion service, such an onion service does not need to have a three hop circuit. It, it can just connect directly to the, to the rendezvous point and uh, get uh, better performance because it doesn't do three hops, it just connects directly. So single onion services are these onion services that, are, that have better performance but they lose anonymity. It's for specific use cases like blockchain, Facebook and all that stuff. And um, we find it quite interesting because it reduces load on the network and it still makes uh, client, uh, the clients remain anonymous, of course. Nothing changes on the security of the clients. And uh, the clients have a much better um, experience, let's say. Um, okay, so these are some, uh, some uh, selections of the developments we're currently doing. Believe me, there are more things that are happening, but they don't uh, fit in this uh, talk. And... Um, and uh, we just want to let you know that we're actively developing this stuff. We're uh, a few developers that are, uh, are working uh, more or less on this thing. And uh, we always need help in, uh, in analyzing the design, uh, security analysis, and all that stuff. Uh, you can check the Tor Dev mailing list. Uh, this is where we do our design work, basically. If you, if you check the archives, you can see various proposals. All the things we described so far exist in, in, uh, in like, uh, proposals, tech proposals. Um, and also we have limited development firepower. So if you're good at testing code, uh, reviewing code, uh, or whatever, it's show up to our IRC channel and uh, ask for, uh, ask for uh, tasks or something. We're usually friendly people, overloaded friendly people. So <laughs> we will try to, to direct you correctly. Um, and uh, we're reaching the final stage of this talk with the takeaways. All right. So here are some of the tips to keep your Onion addresses safe and secure. First of all, don't run relays. Uh, if you're running an Onion address, if you run a relay, it basically reveals your Onion address. Um, use Unix sockets whenever you can to avoid like TCP connections altogether. It's amazing security. Keep your Tor up to date. Um, like, just don't run ancient Tor version, and you know, expect the le excuse me, the least um, like you know that the recent security. Like, it's not gonna happen. Um, audit your config files. Like, um, a lot of people make a lot of mistakes in their web servers. For example, like there is this thing in um, in Apache apparently that uh, mod. Um, status or something like that, that basically leaks a lot of information about all the people who are connected to that web server. If you go to that, um, I know it's, it's a lengthy link down there, but uh, if you search the internet for um, Rise Up um, Onion Services Best Practices, you can find that link. Um, good people of Rise Up have put together a best practices document on how to run Onion Services um, with the most security. Um, use a stealth 
authentication whenever you can because that way, even if you leak the at your onion address, um, they can't connect to it because it's you know like uh, they need the key and also because you can recycle those things pretty quickly. It, all it takes is just basically uh, commenting one line in your um, Tor RC file and re restarting your Tor client. That's it. And um, OPSEC, I mean, you can't, like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you, you, you probably know um, enough about this. Like, if you have bad OPSEC, you can't, like, if, if you do everything else wrong, you can't uh, put your life and, and activism on, um, on just the technology itself. Um, it's, I think it's very important, like if you're, like especially for, for um, activist use cases in crazy situations, especially in Middle East. Um, so here, uh, like we need a lot of, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's one of the things that we need a uh, community to get more involved in this kind of things. We need more creative ideas and um, experiments with, uh, with Onion services. Uh, all the, all the um, interesting use cases actually came from the community, not the Tor project itself. Um, like two good examples of that um, is um, Onion Share and Ricochet and Pond, actually three. Um, I think Ricochet was the, the idea was based on Pond, uh, but yeah, we need more uh, more people and like legitimate organizations to run Onion services and not just for their like having websites is is one thing and having like different different services running different services over Onion is also another thing. Like, um, I check my email over Onion because, you know, uh, I basically avoid man-in-the-middle attacks altogether. I also uh, have this um, set up on my, like, personal mail server that uh, because I use um, hidden service authentication, only I can connect to that um, mail server over IMAP and, and nothing else, you know, can get in. Uh, so you can, like, we we need more people to run onion services because because that way we can like find the problems and everything. Um, many applications benefit from the from the native Tor clients in their um, native native Tor clients in their in their application and also uh, native onion addresses. Uh, Facebook did something um, amazing on the Facebook for Android that if you have if you have Orbit installed and if you have Facebook for Android. It, um, there is an option that um, is like kind of like hidden option that appears that it basically sends all of your traffic over over Onion. Um, GPG that uh, just um, started you know uh, supporting Tor. Um, it's one of the options in the in the recent um, options Bitcoin uses um, at Onion thing, and we also need more ways to quickly uh, run this Onion services. Um, and like basically, if you need them, like for I don't know, like ten minutes or ten hours, and then you know that that's it. You can um, you you need more ways to be able to like quickly deploy these things. I don't know if you're uh, if you're Docker people, like Docker Magic or whatever. Um, tells like there is a, G a Google Summer of Code uh, project happening at Tor right now that um, one of the students is working on Tail Server, which has similar ideas, but um, it's always better to have different approaches uh, for different thread models and different um, situations. And uh, finally, we need um, more ways uh, to find useful and um, you know, like uh, relevant um, Onion services or Onion sites. A lot of, um, like there is, there's Amia that uh, is this search engine and there are um, a bunch of tools like um, XMPP-Client is, is an XMPP client that has uh, hard-coded the Jabber address of known um, Jabber servers like, um, like jabber.ccc.de, um, and we need like more things like that to happen, um, so we can we can find these onion addresses that are useful and we can use. Uh, RiseUp also has this uh, page that basically every service that they run has an equivalent of onion. So if you can, if you want to fetch your email over onion address, you can, or if you want to connect to RiseUp Jabber over onion or use any other services. Thank you. Just a quick plea. Um, first of all, if you want to go to the, uh, we have time for questions now. Please use the microphone and please ask your question in the form of a question. Okay. 
Hey guys. Um, hi, I'm Dan LaFar. I'm from George Mason University. Um, we work on cloud robotics a lot. You know, the bad actors are our enemies, but our biggest enemy is latency. Uh, so I, I like this, but have you done any tests for latency and what, what could I expect? Uh, any additional latency, basically. Mm, yeah, I, 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 I actually don't know exactly what kind of latency you expect and you, you would like to have. I don't think you can treat uh, Tor as a real-time system where the latency is well known and everything. Um, sometimes the latency is much better than you would expect from a thing that has six hops. But uh, in general, and depending on the threat model of your, uh, of your things, because uh, maybe they don't need to be pure anonymous, they can have less hops, I don't know, they can be single onion services or something, um, you can have improved performance. But um, without knowing the exact specs of your, of your, of your thing, I cannot uh, know if it's uh, the right thing to do. Yeah, if latency is what you're fighting for, for um, there needs to be more research. Uh, but you haven't done any tests on the latency. Okay. Oh. I see. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. So you mentioned um, uh, Vanguard, the, the Vanguard system for um, uh, avoiding the, the uh, attack on hidden services guard nodes. It seems to me the main reason you need that is that an attacker can cause the uh, Onion service to make new circuits. Wouldn't that apply to other Tor clients as well? Is, uh, um, or are you considering using the vanguards for other, other clients? Um, okay, so for normal clients, you usually cannot force a Tor client to create an arbitrary number of circuits, as you can do for hidden services. Well, sure, but consider like a, um, a web page running JavaScript that has a, uh, um, a uh, cross-origin anonymous uh, script thing. Presumably, th that will go in a different Tor circuit, right? Um, I actually don't know how circuit okay, escalation right. works in this case, but indeed you can think that over time the, the, any client will eventually create enough number of circuits that you, it, w it, it will hit your middle node eventually. Um, actually, when we designed the Vanguard proposal, we actually thought of applying this to clients so that it's uh, symmetric, you know, so that it's, uh, all, the, all, the, all the entities use the same path construction basically. So. If we did it for hidden services, we would most probably do it for clients as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Also, thank you for the great work. Hi. Um, just how decentralized is the directory system, and how are the directory nodes chosen by the network? Um, so decentralized, uh, basically there are eight servers around the world. Uh, there is two in the US, two in Netherlands, two in Germany, one in Austria. Something like that. Uh, uh, they are chosen very carefully. Let me say it, to say that. So they're always they, there's no organization running in a direct a directory. Authority. It's always a person uh, that we trust that the community knows. This person needs to come to dev meetings uh, with that most people actually met in person. Uh, so that's for the operator part. And the network part, we try to use also trust in networks. Uh, for instance, run it as RiseUp, some in universities, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we wouldn't run a directory authority, uh, for instance, instead of Etzner or VH or stuff like that. Anyway, they don't want that. Then. So that's as much security we have for directory authorities. Have you thought about using like a distributed hash table kind of a thing? Uh, there have been multiple uh, proposal about uh, making it better, less centralized in some ways, and so on and so forth. But uh, this this directory authority system, this consensus and the votes are actually extremely complicated. Uh, and then so ripping it out and changing that by like a distributed system or hash tables, or you don't need trust on like five percent of the nodes. It's actually a huge piece of work. So yeah, it would be nice. Uh, we just need you know more resources, I guess. Thank you. There are some, on this topic, there are some researchers from EPFL that uh, are designing some sort of decentralized authority system and they're in discussion with the Tor developers, but it's a, it's a really complicated thing, like the bootstrapping of P2P systems in general is a pretty hard problem and this super node thing is uh, one of the de facto ways to, to, to get through it basically. Hey guys, thanks for all your work. Just quick question. Do you guys have any kind of an estimate of when this stuff will land and be publicly available? Rough, specific, anything? Uh, okay, estimate. Um, so we, had, we, broke the, we broke this thing in five steps. Uh, one, two, three. We had 
three and a half right now. So I would not expect this in maybe maybe like okay, let's be optimistic, like in a year, around that. It's uh, it's uh, if you remember the slide yesterday from the other uh, the other uh, um, um, talk, we had this uh, construction of onions, which is nice, which is nice, and it's the problem, right? So. One thing we didn't say is that this hidden service, hidden service design right now will live in parallel with the new system. And just for those two to work together in terms of codes and C codes, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. So I'll say a year. Great, thank you. Uh, on this topic, again, we're literally two, three developers uh, with uh, okay. not even full time, some of us. So more funding, more developers would really accelerate this, uh, this task, basically. Also, if you are a C developer, join us. <laughs> yeah, C developer, please. Hey, thanks for all your work, guys. Um, my question was, when you had that diagram where you were running those compartmentalized app server, DB server, all that, um, and when you use a Tor relay between them, is there any way to kind of address that might not have enough bandwidth for you exactly, or? Um, a Tor relay? and. Uh, I, uh, when you had the app server and the DB server, and you, yeah, it's, it's way back there. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the the, the the reason that I ask is because it's it's not your it's not a good idea to run Tor uh, relays on any of the um, any of the that one onion right services that you run. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I meant between like the web server, app server, DB, when you're running like a Tor connection between the t all these servers, is there any way to kind of address that it might be slow and sluggish because there's not really enough bandwidth if it's not on your own network? Uh, it's not usually an, an issue. I run one of these stacks, and uh, basically what happens is that app server pushes. Uh, it's if you um, look at this uh, image, actually, there's only one way from app server to to the web server, mm -hmm. and um, app server basically pushes to the nginx uh, reverse proxy every uh, I think hour. So mm -hmm. latency is not really um, a big thing. Okay. Like um, yeah. Like in this in this scenario, there is nothing like uh, there is no like literally real time changes that needs to be pushed. But um, I don't like I wouldn't expect like more maybe like five minutes max. You would have like with caching and everything. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Thank you for the talk. I had one question about risk. The HSD or de-anonymization uh, de attack. Uh, you mentioned that you can collect information about onion address access. What kind of information could leak? What's the risk? So if you pull off the attack, you can de-anonymize the client, basically. So you know which client goes to which onion address. So this is a de-anonymized attack on the client side. If you get the guard, the guard knows with, uh, as direct, uh, uh, direct connections. Clients is direct connection to a guard. So if you get the guard, you can de-anonymize the client. So in this case, just keep in mind, it's getting the guard is not enough. You have to actually take down the, the machine, go there, get the net flow of the ISP, and, and, and you know which one it is. Uh, so one, this is one of the reasons why we have uh, uh, rotation periods at the Vanguard, is that we expect that in five to 11 days on the second set, well, the takedown is, uh, it takes uh, longer than that in the uh, uh, political system. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a hack, but uh, this is what I, we have. Thank you. So thanks, let's first of all, give them a big hand. But don't move. Uh, so if you, uh, if you are here, if you wanna go to Cory Doctorow's keynote, which is in Lamar, Lamar is full. Um, you will not get in if you leave here to go see it. It will be simulcast in this room. Uh, so if you wanna go to the keynote, stay put is basically uh, the way you're gonna get to see it. And you'll see it on the big screen with surround sound and um, vibrato seats and everything. It's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be just like reality, but better. Yeah. Oh, um, by the way, since we are on this slide, I wanna add a note that like, you can basically, uh, the, the amazing thing about this thing is that you, you can basically run a revolution from your basement. It's, it can be um, like these three VMs could be like three Raspberry Pis. Um, and nobody knows the location of it. And if you're if you're even like um, I don't know like crazy like me, you can um, 
even have this uh, Git repository that like you, you you can have like a puppet server, a puppet master, and like uh, even the puppet master is running on Onion, and you don't even have to like have access to these things uh, physically. So you can just you know push to Git and over Onion, and Git would push to this puppet master over Onion, and the uh, the puppet master would just push to all the different servers. Anyways, thank you. <laughs>